conference organized with the DLB papers on Macron's uh, executive orders. As you'll see, we're uh, uh, going to underscore the uh, salient points of this reform, the ratification law, the valley uh, order. Uh, we decided we would focus on the main changes. And when it comes to more technical parts, uh, uh, to go a bit further on specific elements, uh, Cabinet DLA will invite you to uh, take part in practical workshops. We have the pleasure and honor to give the kickoff of this conference with Pierre-André uh, Humbert, the social uh, uh, advisor to the Elysee. You are the linchpin of the reform of the labor law, aren't you? Uh, I'd like to recall that in the past, uh, you were members of the uh, SAPA, Repsam, and El Comi uh, uh, cabinets. Uh, so, uh, please, could you answer this question? Does this reform make France more attractive or not? We are in part of criticism. We are uh, perceived as uh, having an extremely rigid and strict labor system. Thank you. Good morning to all. Well, I'm fully awake by now. Thank you very much for inviting me to kick off this uh, uh, morning session. Uh, you're going to go through the various uh, domain aspects of this uh, reform. I don't want to uh, give a full disclosure of this uh, subject, but I'd like to answer your basic questions and what do we expect of these reforms? And in the future, these uh, uh, executive orders will become a, a law as the uh, draft bill is being uh, processed, as I'm talking to you. Probably the process will be completed somewhere around uh, late February. As to the orders and this uh, reform, basically, It's a new uh, area that is about to start. Uh, there is a, a deep change in the way in which uh, the regulation, the labor market is organized. Uh, they're not self-sufficient. And as you probably uh, noticed by now, we've already entered a new cycle uh, of reform with the uh, unemployment insurance, uh, uh, traineeship, apprenticeship. But labor law is a, a topic which is very pregnant, very uh, present in the daily life or corporate life, and uh, as you rightly said, is perceived as a major disadvantage uh, by foreign uh, investors. The orders set up a new regulatory system that would put at the heart, at the core of the regulation, collective uh, agreements, collective bargaining. And this is uh, the corporate uh, uh, agreement, collective agreement. So there's been a, a number of reforms which are uh, suggested, and they're bound to transform your daily uh, practice, and substantially uh, so, and more in the future, because at the first phase, you have to uh, take stock of uh, uh, the uh, uh, situation, and some uh, topics are more urgent than others. But the most important point, point probably is that we try to uh, uh, provide an answer to the issue of globalization, find the right way to uh, encourage uh, regulation that is as close as possible to what uh, uh, wage earners and uh, credit managers uh, uh, need to do. The collective uh, uh, agreement leaves uh, 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 leeway by the actors, you know, they remain free to decide on the rules that govern their daily life. A company, a corporation, is a group, and there are uh, a number of musts there, and they vary a great deal from one company to the next. The way in which labor and work is organized is now the same. Uh, customers' requirements varies too, and therefore uh, we too need to adapt, and we don't operate or function the same way according to whether you are uh, fully part and parcel of a global economy, uh, stakeholders in a, a global uh, a trade, or a regional uh, actor. And this is why there are many different approaches and many different uh, demands on the part of uh, companies. So if I'm asked to um, answer, respond to all the issues that companies have, eventually, and that's what the case in the past, uh, you have to denounce a general rule. You don't want to have a, a, a all-encompassing law, because if you do this, you'll have to come up with a, a spate of exceptions. 
Now, uh, practice and daily life is far more uh, diversified, what the lawmakers think of, and this is why we have a, a full list, a long list of exceptions. Hence, uh, the inflation of the labor code, the fact that it becomes totally impossible uh, to provide for rules. And at the end of the day, because, of course, the actual life is more complex than the theory of it, you can't really solve all specific issues. So there's been a change in the reasoning. It's the other way around. Our basic assumption is that we have to um, trust, and this is what President of the Public referred to, uh, putting one's trust in democracy. Let's leave it for stakeholders who live uh, in this uh, uh, world uh, to adapt the rules and the uh, laws they need to go by. It doesn't mean that given full flexibility that everything will be decided by the companies, that there won't be any labor law anymore or labor code. But when it comes to payment uh, systems, the way in which uh, uh, working time is organized, all this should be organized and provided for by uh, company agreements. So this ability, the capacity to organize things and uh, make it part and parcel of the collective agreements is uh, uh, everywhere. The way in which you operate on a daily basis with a social agenda, as I like to call it. In the future, the company may uh, organize its social uh, uh, negotiations or uh, as a, a function of its strategy. Suppose they want to discuss orient strategic uh, orientation and new guidance. If it takes uh, three years, well, it will take three years. If you want to discuss uh, wage issues uh, immediately, you can do this immediately or decide to uh, do it on a longer term. Same thing for all the negotiations. And by doing this, you uh, return a very strong f uh, role to the uh, uh, human resource function. It is not, uh, you know, social dialogue is something that you, you do at the end of the day once you've done all the rest. It could become a strategic way uh, in your approach to deploying a, a project. So that's why we want to give flexibility to the organization and also uh, to give more uh, um, adapting, adapting power to the company. Very often, investors ask us, OK, things go wrong. How can I possibly adjust or adapt? Would it be possible uh, to uh, change tax overnight to get reorganized, to change my views, because I do see that uh, uh, there are opportunities, but there are challenges at when. And of course, I fear that you have need to adapt. I won't be able to adapt or change. So it's going to be, be a, a, a main pitfall for the company. It's something that they come and ask from day one, as you know, because very often people come to us, uh, say companies, you know, uh, uh, do not uh, 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 discuss the dismissal issue or redundancy issue from day one. Of course, their intention is not to, to make people redundant when they uh, start up editing a country. But the question is a longer term. Suppose I need to change. Will it be possible if I'm faced with the uh, headwinds? So uh, with the uh, corporate agreement or company agreement, uh, you'll be given uh, uh, more opportunities to adapt uh, with the collecting, uh, collective agreement. And of course, uh, uh, we'll be discussing the details of the uh, termination, different uh, uh, possibilities uh, to sign uh, competitiveness agreements uh, or the possibility to develop voluntary uh, redundancy or voluntary dismissal plans. But the philosophy is that via collective agreement, you will be free to adapt uh, all the uh, parameters and the uh, public authorities will have to check two things, essentially. Number one is the fact that there is a fair negotiation. If you go for collective agreement, it has to be uh, on a fair basis. You need to share information, full disclosure, and put everything on the table. And number two, you want to make sure that those who approve it and sign are legitimate. And this is why the consistency of the reform system is the fact that uh, uh, trade unions uh, that represent the majority of uh, voters will put their hand and sign the uh, paper. And this is really the quintessence of uh, uh, agreement, a free agreement. You negotiate as you wish. Uh, if you want to uh, design a, or devise an agreement, um, our purpose is not to tell you, okay, go ahead and negotiate, and negotiate A, B, C, D, and so on and so forth. 
because we trust the institution, but we want to explain you how to go about it, which is a great surprise on the part of the state. The state is an expert in collective negotiation, collective bargaining, as you well know. And in conclusion, it's very straightforward. If you go that way, there won't be an agreement. It's not possible if we try to explain uh, to make sure that people uh, uh, fit in uh, uh, different boxes, uh, uh, there won't be an agreement. Of, if there is an agreement, it will be going to be a formal agreement. Collective bargaining implies a high degree of flexibility, plasticity. You have to be able uh, to end up with a tailor-made uh, suit. And this is what it's all about with this uh, new uh, legislation. Each one should be able uh, to tailor-made his uh, uh, agreement as required by the company. So this is the basic point. And this is unheard of in the um, uh, French approve, approach to collective uh, bargaining and collective agreements. So it's ambitious. It's extremely demanding because it means that there has to be a wide agreement. It's not easy to have a company agreement. The uh, culture of uh, the agreement has to disseminate uh, uh, through the company, uh, from top management uh, down to uh, uh, the basic level. Also, the social partners have to be involved and accept the new uh, rules of the game. And this is why the ca this type of reform takes so much time. The second point in this reform is simplification of a social dialogue. Let's not underscore or uh, uh, the huge transformation that uh, will uh, be imposed on all the social partners. It's uh, symbolic because since the more than a century, or let's close a century, uh, we've uh, added structures on top of one another rather than streamlining the system. There's maybe no streamlining. And this is the first time that we decided we'd take the consequences. We're shifting to a new world where we want to establish a social dialogue that has more strategic so that you don't really split up all the issues and questions uh, so that the same people wearing a different hat according to the place where they're uh, operating uh, uh, rehashes the same topics. It's a pretty uh, 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 sterile environment that is far uh, removed from uh, everybody's concerns. And then there's a, a delegation to human resource managers, and they, too, in turn, delegate this uh, to uh, union representatives. And this is actually a vain exercise. And of course, this is not what this social dialogue is all about. So there's been uh, there's going to be only one social economic council. This is going to be a major change uh, to make uh, the whole system more simple and fewer uh, organs to consult. And there are fewer risk uh, to uh, waste time. The uh, time frame is going to be much uh, shorter, much smaller, and we'll have a survey strategic purpose. As to the future of the staff, the way in which was organized, uh, the well-being at work, uh, you know, you can't really split the issues. Uh, it can't be split between different bodies. You, it's much better to have one single place or locus where you can look at the consequences of the way in which work is organized on the employees, uh, the economic impact, uh, the ergonomic impact, rather than splitting up uh, the issues in many different ways. So it's a re-focusing. Re, uh, uh, streamlining, and the um, company uh, council will be the main uh, body there. Now, the third pillar of the reform, let's have four pillars instead of three, is uh, small uh, companies, smaller companies, the first orders that uh, are geared to about half of uh, 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 staff members who are in companies of less than 50 uh, workers or employees. Collective bargaining for all, was perceived as a possibility uh, to uh, go for more competition, to help companies face the challenge. But for the other half of employees, 90% of companies, 
you tell it, sorry, it's not for you, because you don't have the adequate size. Therefore, you have no possibility to go for uh, uh, collective bargaining as you don't have any trade union representatives. Uh, there's none. So 40% of representatives is in companies under uh, uh, 50, no possibility of collective bar bargaining or collective agreements. It's nothing new. Uh, social partners, too, in the <clears throat> 1995 agreement that was just after the 93 crisis, it's not by chance that these negotiations took place after the major crisis. It did show that there is an issue with the companies under 50 uh, employees, and that you had to uh, enable them uh, to go for collective agreement, even though the uh, staff uh, headcount is less than 50. And this is uh, what we were allowed to do, uh, give them the uh, power, uh, the same powers that they get. Uh, similarly, uh, if companies under 20 uh, workers, the uh, manager, when negotiating collective agreements, will have to, uh, or may, uh, uh, offer or suggest uh, um, changes <coughs> uh, to be ratified and voted by the employees. The fourth pillar is uh, uh, attractiveness. When drafting the um, executive orders, we tried to identify all the irritants, quote unquote, uh, all the parts or the elements of the labor code. We've changed many of those, by the way, that do not uh, uh, bring any added value to uh, employees which appear to be an exception, or it is an exception in the world, or even uh, perhaps an, an exception in Europe, but even in the world, uh, whereby labor law would be far more complicated in France uh, compared with other countries. In fact, this is not the case. Uh, but there are many irritants indeed, uh, and uh, you notice uh, that the information you're supposed to get is not the same here as abroad. When you start, or we'd go for a M&A uh, project, you have to be starting from the same basis, and then uh, at the end, uh, the one that is last uh, in the in the race is France. Why is it? Because uh, the whole process is far more time consuming. So we tried to, to identify all these irritants. I could give you many examples. Uh, like the uh, scope uh, given to you uh, when it comes to assessment, uh, the validity of the reasons for redundancy or dismissal. It's a difficult topic because the subject is difficult. Uh, economic redundancy, of course, is a difficult and conflictual uh, uh, topic. But the French uh, l legislation uh, needs to take it into account not only the situation that prevails in France, but in a given uh, activity in, in Europe and in the whole world. It's based on case law, by the way. It's not uh, based in legislation. And, uh, we are uh, the exception in the world. There's no other country that uh, shares in the same approach. Uh, and the effects of this uh, approach, of course, uh, are quite uh, destructive, as uh, other people, other countries around us uh, uh, have many misconceptions as to the way we operate. It never prevented uh, uh, M&As or a reorganization to, to happen. In reading the uh, 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 changes in the industrial uh, pattern, we see that our country is the one where there's uh, most losses of industrial jobs over the past uh, 10 years. And it means that we're not very good at protecting people, at taking into account the global uh, uh, scope of uh, redundancies. And probably uh, we uh, make demands on the parent company and when the board. Uh, you want to see the uh, accounts and periods of all companies and uh, to demonstrate that the uh, profits uh, abroad do not are used to offset the losses incurred in France. You know, this is a never recurring uh, topic. All top management say that this is a problem, even though it doesn't have any effect on the extent of the reorganization. In fact, it does a, uh, deflect much of our powers. And of course, many people are put off thinking that it's going to, to be very, very complicated to set up business in France. And of course, the effect of representations may have uh, negative uh, performances by uh, 
of course, you're bound to see major impact on that possibility to retract investment coming from abroad. At the same time, you don't remove anything from an employee because this system was not efficient. So you're not going to um, detract from their benefits. And then uh, global uh, uh, re-qualification or redeployment. I think that you are probably the only ones, the only country uh, in Europe uh, where we have this obligation to offer jobs abroad. It's not a problem that we have to offer jobs uh, in, uh, in, uh, to our uh, new jobs uh, to our uh, employees. You have to uh, get the list of all the jobs available in other countries uh, before you reorganize your company. So taken about all the job opportunities uh, abroad. So possibly this is the, uh, sending the wrong signal. OK, you're asking for jobs, uh, whether lawyers are extremely uh, strict. They, it would be good uh, to freeze them, the jobs, uh, the vacancies, uh, during a period of time. Uh, so it doesn't, I'm not, I'm not uh, doing this business, so I had to freeze it all. Everybody refers to this uh, uh, handicap. Does it have any positive impact on the uh, re-employment of uh, uh, employees? No. International mobility, there are very few uh, and far between. And these international, so-called international mobilities were organized, uh, and this uh, outside of the, uh, the um, framework of uh, the uh, statute requirements. Uh, no one would say uh, I'd rather be made redundant rather than that be sent uh, abroad. Even uh, though there are opportunities for uh, redeployment abroad. And another point uh, which applies both uh, to uh, small companies, very small companies, and uh, makes for greater attractiveness in the cost issue. Now, talking about the attractivity or attractiveness of the company, you know, business hates uncertainty. And this is why uh, there was a lot of uncertainty when it comes to the, tr the time frame of a reorganization, and also uh, uncertainty over cost. It's not the case anymore. Uh, there's no uh, certainty anymore. There are uh, pre-fixed uh, uh, time limits, and we've been able to see that uh, uh, these uh, time starts has been uh, kept, and also the cost uncertainty, not the social plan itself, which of course has a cost. Uh, we know uh, where we can, where it can be done, but it was a major uncertainty about the future. Suppose uh, there are uh, industrial uh, disputes, so, and of course, uh, I'm not sure how much uh, I will have to pay for that. There are two possibilities. Either you under-assess uh, the package, of course, the worst case uh, scenario, having to go back and back and say, uh, you were about to give me a package for redeployment. In fact, it was going to cost me more because we have many expensive disputes. Or you try to anticipate and uh, you do a risk assessment and you know that this is going to be uh, this as an average, but perhaps a bit more. And in fact, you go for the higher uh, level. So if you look at the ex ante project, you will be perceived as very uh, uh, expensive, very costly. So these are two negative uh, scenarios as to your capacity to um, grow investment in the country. So talking about uh, uh, small companies, uh, this is really a freezing situation because it means that for years and years, they have the democracy democ sword uh, above the heads of the company manager. And uh, uh, it's kind of freezing effect. Uh, I've conducted many investigations and many inquiries uh, in the small companies. Everybody has a friend, a colleague who has a, a friend of his, and they had to uh, leave because uh, they had a, a, a dispute, uh, a, a negative outcome uh, at the uh, in industrial uh, uh, tribunal. So they know that we are in this situation. And this is why they decided not to hire people. I'm far more happier uh, doing business alone I may not uh, uh, make more money if uh, my company grows. I'd rather uh, go small. And of course, it's a loss of uh, opportunity, loss of uh, uh, jobs, potentially. So what we'd like to do is not original. We'd like to emulate what our neighbors are doing, capping the uh, amounts of compensation in Italy, in Germany. And this enables you to do two things. Number one, it's a fair uh, compensation given to an employee when the judge decided that there's no real or serious cause for the dismissal. It's all the capacity given 
to everybody to know exactly what the maximum amount will be according to the seniority level. So by doing so, there will be fewer disputes that go to the end of the process and will encourage uh, friendly settlements so that employees will be able to recover faster and company managers will have w the possibility to, to move on and the big groups uh, uh, will uh, get rid of this uh, major handicap. And this is very important uh, both uh, for attractiveness and uh, small companies. We know there is a cap and of course it's for each one of us uh, to go faster, uh, negotiating faster. We know that you can't expect to gain more than uh, a few months of uh, employee as uh, remuneration. Of course, it's based on the current practices, but there was so much, uh, uh, such great variety, and uh, it, it would all depending on the Court of Appeal where you were uh, brought to, and the uh, decision uh, handed down might be uh, three times uh, the amount uh, uh, awarded by another court of appeal. So the judge, of course, the court is free to assess the quantum, but there are limits, uh, and these limits uh, were fixed, have been fixed by the legislature. So you see, in the Macron's orders, executive orders, there is a, a deliberate uh, a determination uh, to uh, look at the changes that occurred over the past 20 years to come up with a new form of regulation of the mar labor market based on the collective uh, agreement. And we'd also determined because we do believe in social dialogue. And we know there can be no good uh, uh, social collective agreement unless there's a proper dialogue. We want to streamline the system and give answer uh, to the problems we have uh, in um, dealing with the uh, daily issues. So this is really the main features of this uh, uh, executive orders. So it sounds to be very simple and nice put in a nutshell if you look at the uh, length of this uh, uh, amendments, of course, it will take many training sessions to be able to understand uh, the gist of this uh, 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 scrutiny. Uh, lawyers, of course, have a significant role to play and will have to play the same uh, in months to come to um, make sure that these orders are properly implemented. It is for you, company managers, to decide uh, uh, um, what uh, whether you want to use these orders, you have uh, to uh, uh, rely on your collective capacity. And uh, the government decided uh, that you uh, would uh, have this capacity of uh, taking steps and acting. Uh, it's been put in your hands. Of course, there are bound to be a few adjustments. Uh, necessary changes uh, will stand ready to help you at all times so that the system as a whole um, operates in a more efficient way. So our job is not fully done yet, but your job is uh, uh, just beginning. Merci beaucoup, Pierre André Imbert. Je crois qu'on a tous pris du coup la mesure stratégique et puis philosophique. Thank you very much. I think now we understand the reform. Uh, you've used expressions like changing the logic, predictability, etc. All of these key words that show us how. Uh, we might be more attractive. Now we'll take some minutes, not too many, for the Q&A if you've any questions to ask before we continue with the next speaker. Hello. Now uh, you were negotiating these uh, orders and have you talked about the usual idea that is to change what we call the social thresholds. Okay, you've said it's the usual uh, theme uh, that is the social thresholds, but as far as thresholds are concerned, what we intended to do is that, or rather, let me put this in another way, the, the thresholds have not been changed. Usually when we talk about thresholds, we're not saying that they're going to vanish altogether. We're not going to have the same rules for a company that has 10 people and another one that has 1,000. So sometimes we're thinking about changing the limits or the thresholds, or at least we want the transition to be a smoother transition between the different categories. But I think that now that we're going to have just one body, the so-called CSE body, that is Economic and Social Council, well, our objective was to, how can I say, 
um, let me try and find the word, to do something that would be a smoother transition between the different categories. I think we've taken into account the different uh, companies and their size. Uh, we didn't want to uh, put too much emphasis on the different thresholds between the different categories, social categories. Now, this is a change. Is it justified for the SMEs and uh, is it okay for a large company as well? And uh, the social landscape is different. And in terms of industrial relations, we have different worlds. For instance, companies with fewer than 20 people. Now, in this case, uh, it's exceptional to have personnel uh, uh, representatives or shop stewards. You have companies between 20 and 100 people. I'm not talking about threshold of 50 people. And then you have more uh, personnel representatives, but no uh, trade unions. And then companies with more than 300 people and then, in this case, they have uh, union representatives and personnel uh, representatives, and that's when you can consider collective bargaining agreement. It's always very difficult to have a law uh, that is a one-size-fits-all for all sizes of companies, which means that you always have to have these uh, triggers and thresholds. Now, we can always say we have to fight against this because then when you go from one category to the next, uh, you would have too many obstacles and you wouldn't want the company to grow, which is not what we want to do. But at the same time, we think we shouldn't put on companies exactly the same obligation. So we need to have a transition, a smooth transition, so that you don't go from one category to the next all of a sudden, which is what you, people uh, are fearing from these orders. We'll take another question. Yes, madam, please. Go ahead. Hello. Um, in terms of capping, you have set a cap, but the risk is that maybe it could be circumvened that is, uh, if we look at the reasons for redundancies, uh, some uh, systems might go against the capping system. And um, I know that judges don't like anything to be imposed upon them. And uh, the risk in this case is that maybe judges uh, will not want a capping on the fines imposed. Don't you think that the uh, capping could be circumvened, therefore? Well, Mr. Uh, Ambert will answer that, but we have a roundtable on this at the end of our meeting. Perhaps a few ideas on that, but we have a panel on that. We don't want to unveil all of the ideas that we're going to discuss later on. Now, we have a capping system, and the capping system will not cover all of the reasons the same applies in Italy and in Germany as well. And, uh, of course, you can't cover all types of economic reasons. Uh, there's no... Uh, what we don't want to do is to set aside the real and serious uh, causes. Uh, there are fundamental freedoms that still exist that will be appraised and assessed by the judges. I'm not that afraid. I'll try and answer your question. I do not distrust judges at all, but if you look at common practice, you will see what people do. Uh, we have lawyers in the room, and everybody knows that uh, we have uh, capping systems in the different tribunals. Of course, they're not official, but if you look at the rulings given, well, we have a report on that with 4,000 uh, settlements or rulings. What's very important is not the trend. It's when we have peaks and troughs and when we have big differences, because then people expect something when they go to the courts. They think, OK, we have to have a high capping, and then for similar cases, you have different uh, results. If you look at practices, what we do is not far from what people actually do in the field. And then we're going to converge with time, I suppose. We'll keep an eye, of course, on the first rulings or settlements. And uh, frankly speaking, what really matters is to look at 90% of the settlements or the rulings.
Thank you, Pierre-André Humbert, for being with us. Uh, thank you for giving us the general background. Now we'll be uh, looking at all the details of the reform. Thank you very much for being with us.